this time we are covering Nintendo Power's fourth year, a year which hails our first major titles in an effectively new genre of video games. However, before we get to these titles, we have a bunch of the old stuff to get through in Nintendo Power number 37 for June of 1994. Our cover game for this issue is Lemmings. It's a drawn art cover as opposed to the dioramas we'd gotten earlier, and I kind of wish we'd gotten a diorama with this one. The art style of Lemmings feels conductive for that sort of claymation, or um, less mation, but clay diorama style of art. In our letters column this issue, we have a whole bunch of letters talking about prospective format changes to the magazines, with opinions on both sides over the new comics, along with a letter wanting the magazine to be bi-monthly, though based on how the letter is worded, I think they mean bi-weekly. There's also a letter from a reader wanting less Super Nintendo coverage. Bad news, pal. I think the Super Nintendo is here to stay, at least for a few years anyway, and the NES is on its way out. Because we're covering the NES version of the Lemmings this issue, we're getting to it first thing. The NES guide covers five, le five levels each on the fun and tricky difficulty settings, and one each on the taxing and mayhem difficulties. I've already covered the Super Nintendo version of Lemmings, and the NES version is, unfortunately, not quite as good as its 16-bit counterpart. The camera perspective is too far zoomed out, making it difficult to select specific Lemmings that are moving in a particular direction particularly if they're really close together. And there's a delay in switching types that is just enough to make strategies for particular sections kind of difficult to get through. This also strips the game away of some of its characters. The lemming sprites are much smaller and have much less detail to them. Additionally, you can select lemmings while paused, making things a little more difficult to plan ahead. That said, Lemmings for the NES doesn't have what I was afraid might happen, which was slow down when you had too many Lemmings on screen at once. Once. That said, there is Flicker, which might affect any is my issues with uh, selecting Lemmings. But otherwise, it ran just fine. Next up is Dragonlance Dragon Strike, the first NES D&D licensed game we've covered thus far, with a dragon-based shooter, shooter set in the Dragonlance campaign setting. As of this issue, Dragonlance had been getting some mainstream acclaim through the novels, leading to Forgotten Realms getting a similar push. Or maybe it's the other way around. Anyway, the article has maps of the first 11 levels, stopping just short of the game's conclusion. Dragon Strike is less Xevious, more Desert Strike. Each level has you navigating through a fairly open level, and having you complete various objectives like destroying a certain number of ships or enemy dragons or what have you. Your dragon can move between two vertical planes, and your dragon's attack power varies on what their health is. The game controls remarkably well, and that would almost merit an unquestioned recommendation except for the fact that you only have one life. When you die, you have to start the level over again. Now normally, this isn't a problem, except some levels have boss fights, and you don't get a health refill before you go to the boss fight, which means that things get significantly trickier as you have to take on the boss with whatever health and thus weapon power you had left after the main mission. I still consider the game good and certainly worth checking out if you find a copy, but it's not the best AD&D game on the NES, though it is the best Dragonlance game on the NES. Next up is Stanley, The Search for Dr. Livingston, which is an action platformer with a pulp adventure theme. The article doesn't have any real level maps, instead giving tips for each level, with level 8 being the only one to have any sort of comprehensive map. This game is something of a non-linear platformer. I compared the game somewhat to Splunker in the sense that your character design is similar, the aesthetics are similar, and like in Splunker, there's falling damage. However, the game's environments are much larger and much more involved, to the point that you really need to have a map when playing the game, or be actively making a map while you're playing the game. This leads to the game's other problem. You are very ineffective in combat to begin with. I'd be okay if you were effective in combat, but just squishy and couldn't take much damage before you died, or something similar. You're ineffective in combat, and but enemies were very easy to avoid or significantly easier to, to avoid. Instead, being able to deal very minimal damage to enemies, at least anything that's meaningful, 
in a game where you have to deal with lots of enemies in order to progress is frankly not good. It puts you, put you in a situation where the act of trying to progress in the game becomes less of an enjoyment and more of a chore. In the classified information column, we have an extra lives cheat for Rock and Cats and a money cheat for Faria. I think I might have missed Faria in the NES Best of the Rest episodes. I may get around to that in a breaking it all making it all down episode to make up for it. In this issue's installment of the Legend of Zelda comic, Link manages to defeat Aghanim, only to be sent to the Dark World. Moving on to Game Boy games, we have a more extensive guide for Metroid 2 for the Game Boy. I've noticed that they did this earlier for the NES Metroid, running a second article on the game with a more extensive guide a year or so after its initial release during a slower month of the year. I suspect we'll see something similar happen later for Super Metroid. Ubisoft has put together a port of their Star Wars game on for the Game Boy. This is their NES game. I've got a few level maps, but the guide is more tip-focused. Generally assuming, okay, you're a subscriber, you may be a subscriber, you've probably got the earlier issue where we covered the NES version. Star Wars for the Game Boy has absolutely all of the problems the NES game had, including the big problem I had with falling damage, combined with the fact that the field of view in this version of the game gives you a little less room to plan your actions than the NES version did, and knockback from damage can send you, well, about a whole screen, Game Boy-wise, back, making you more likely to get a cheap hit into falling damage or spikes. Next up is another NBA All-Star Challenge game, NBA All-Star Challenge 2. This article covers the game's roster, which includes Michael Jordan. So, Jordan Mania is going to be starting soon. If it hasn't started already. NBA 2 for the Game Boy has a lot of the problems the first game had including having penalties for charging in a one-on-one -on -one basketball game. That said, this game does fix one big problem with the penalties the last game had. Your opponents will foul you as well, giving you back possession, as opposed to you pulling off penalties or triggering penalties without quite knowing why, and your opponent playing flawlessly. Still, I'm not a fan of video basketball games, and for the games in the genre that I do play and do enjoy, I prefer them on consoles over being on handhelds. In the Super Mario Adventure comic, Luigi has a cunning plan to rescue Mario from Bowser's clutches. A pan plan so cunning that Baldrick would be proud to call it his own. In Counselor's Corner, we have advice on who to fight to get some of the special weapon drops in Final Fantasy II and the recommended stage order for Mega Man 4. Next up is the arcade game Update, an article covering various upcoming arcade titles, which makes one of the few occasions where Nintendo is acknowledging a company and a way to play games outside of their platforms. The article has coverage of the first big revision of Street Fighter 2, Street Fighter 2 Championship Edition, along with Konami's new X-Men and TMNT Brawlers. Now we haven't covered a dungeon crawler for a while, and now we've got one that's also a JRPG with Arcana. The article gives a rundown of the characters and visual style of the game, along with maps of most of the game's dungeons, both in, both in the article itself and in the poster. Arcana is probably the closest game we've gotten to a Super Nintendo version of Shining in the Darkness. The interface is very similar, though with a tarot card style that Shining in the Darkness didn't have. The game scales its levels very well, with multiple interesting dungeon designs and an auto-map built into the game and a reasonable difficulty curve. This is, frankly, a underrated gem in the SNES game library. This is unfortunately also one of the games from HAL Labs that didn't become part of a larger franchise, which is a shame because this is one of my favorite JRPGs and one I consider a rock-solid dungeon crawler and a game which the late Satoru Iwata worked on as a te technical advisor. Next up is Top Gear, a racing game completely unrelated from the magazine, as Top Gear refers to the highest gear on a car. The article gives notes on the, the cars you can drive in the game, the camera perspective, and notes on 12 tracks. For a while, I'd been looking for the ideal racing game for the Super Nintendo. A game outside of F-Zero that just makes racing work on this 16-bit console. Top Gear is almost it. The controls are great, the AI is 
very well balanced, and the settings provide the right amount of simulation versus arcade elements with different cars having different amounts of grip, and the option to play with a manual or automatic transmission. The one problem I have is this is a game which, well, is only played in a split-screen mode in the sense that you, if you're playing single-player, you still have a split-screen with the second player's field of view below you on the on the bottom of the screen, so you have to deal with that as well, which can be kind of distracting and takes away from your field of view on the game's levels. Now, we haven't gotten a Formula One game in this magazine in a while. Well, we've got another one now with F1, Race of Champions. The article gives notes on how you should tweak your vehicle's performance for each of the tracks, along with maps of five tracks. F1 Race of Champions has some significant problems. In particular, the controls are kind of wonky. I have no real grasp of what my vehicle's performance needs to be for various tracks, aside from what's in the guide, and I need to customize my vehicle to get it right with the money I have available. You can't just go in and drive and adjust your vehicle to fit your playstyle. There is one right way to do it, as opposed to driving the way that the style that fits for you, which is to a certain degree how real racing drivers work. There's, there's an ideal style for each track, but each driver puts their own little flourish on it to a certain degree. So I'm recommending giving this game a miss. Well, earlier this issue we had Lemmings for the NES. Now we've got Krusty's Super Fun House for the Super Nintendo, which sort of is sort of reverse Lemmings with a Simpsons license. The article gives maps and strategies for the first five levels. The concept behind Krusty's Super Fun House, a reverse Lemmings where you're trying to lure the critters to their doom, is interesting, but its attempt to make it work as a reverse Lemmings doesn't quite fly. The controls are pretty terrible, with Krusty slipping and sliding through the level environments, and while the level designs are interesting, the game doesn't really give you a way to quickly reset a puzzle if you find yourself into an unwinnable state, or to pause and scroll through the entirety of the level so you can figure out what you need to do in order to complete the goal, both of which are features in Lemmings. This really could have been the first successful, almost maybe flawless is the wrong word, but caveat-free, enjoyable Simpsons, home console Simpsons game, but it doesn't quite cut it. In Nestor's Adventures, Nestor is Robocop. And the tip is a reminder that you can't backtrack in the game, which I would think would be self-evident if you're playing the game. Of note in the also rands being reviewed in the Now Playing column are Casino Kid and Defenders of Dinatron City, along with Pit Fighter on the Game Boy. In the top 20 column, Mario remains on top for the NES and Super Nintendo, while Samus Aran remains supreme, or reigns supreme, rather, on the Game Boy. In the Celeb Profile column, we have a profile of David Fastino from Married with Children. Fastino has gone on to do a whole bunch of voice acting work, including playing the role of Mako on The Legend of Korra. Wrapping up this issue, the Pack Watch column has a look at the Super Nintendo sequel to Faceball 2000, and the home console port of Out of This World for wrapping up with another look at Mario Paint. My pick of this issue is Arcana. I made a, this game a pick for my best of the rest, back when I was doing these reviews as prose articles, but it bears repeating. Arcana is one of the best RPGs on the Super Nintendo that you've never played, and it's definitely worth your time. I'll make a second pick with Top Gear, as it's a title that I'd seen a lot in various used game stores in my area, but I'd never picked up because, well, I saw it so often I assumed it was bad, or at least bland, sort of like how you see so many Madden games, or that sort of thing. I was wrong. It's definitely worth your time, and definitely worth checking out. Next time, we come at long last to a title that popularized an entirely new genre of video games. Well, maybe not new, but at least got it in the cultural zeitgeist in a way that had never been done before. And that is absolutely something to look forward to.
Once again, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe to this channel. Subscribe and get you notified when future episodes come out. And liking lets me know that you enjoyed the episode. The video on the right will be of the previous episode of Nintendo Power Retrospectives if you want to go see what I reviewed previously that on that show. And the video on the left will take you to the previous episode of Breaking It All Down while well, you'll get to see what I covered there. And below that will be a link to my Patreon page if you wish to back the show. Backing the show can get you a mention in the credits, and also, depending on your level of support, you can determine what I do future Let's Plays of on Breaking It All Down and what else I review on that show as well. So go ahead and click on that and back the show. Also, backing the show helps me get the show out more often and improve the production quality of the show, which is good for everybody. Once again, thank you very much for watching and see you next time.